Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm certainly very grateful that I exercised the patience today and allowed the member from Beaufort South to speak because um, he certainly has made um, my job a lot easier. Um, Mr. Speaker, there's no way that anyone can look at this document and describe it as easy. This is far from easy, Mr. Speaker. Certainly describing what the intention of the Insolvency Act is, is easy. But the reason why that this act has taken so long to get here today is because of the detail that has to go into it. And specifically, and the member from Viewfort South really alluded to it, that the detail of the uniqueness of St. Lucia and to make sure that this act does not put people in a more egregious or more vulnerable position than they are today. Because, you know, the polling on code and, and what has happened here in St. Lucia um, has been for many years. I mean, the member from Viewfort South and I were having a discussion about Haiti and about the constitution that exists in Haiti. And while we can look at it from a distance and say, why well, really should that presidential system that they have be there? But the fact is that that is what people have become accustomed to. They'd rather deal with the devil that they know than all of a sudden now have to rely on the devil that they don't know. So the fact is, is that many individuals and businesses in St. Lucia have found over the years a mechanism to protect themselves. In fact, I remember meeting a particular business person, well known to all of us, and actually it was at a funeral, and I was just saying to him that we had just started the, the, the dialogue to look at the Bankruptcy Act and the Insolvency Act. And the man got so upset with me. <laughs> <laughs> the guy got up and ranted and raved, ranted and, raved and, and, and walked away. And it was not until years afterwards, actually at a funeral, <laughs> that actually he spoke to me again. This is a very personal thing for people, Mr. Speaker. Very, very personal. When you're speaking about people who have saved for years to build a home. And the possibility of having to declare bankruptcy and then dealing with insolvency. People with businesses, <coughs> small businesses, that's not the size of the business, it's the relative importance of that business to their own life. That's why I applaud, I applaud both governments for taking their time in trying to understand those intricacies, those delicate points. And the fact is, let's not run away from it. We want to take credit as to who started this. None of us started it. We had a system. This was being imposed upon us. We were being forced to bring it out. Yes, because we had to harmonize within the OECS, even though none of the other OECS countries have the Napoleonic Code. That made St. Lucia uniquely different. But because of our association, we were being asked to conform. This ridiculous report that used to be here, I, I have zero regard for the report of ease of doing business. St. Lucia has been the top of the ease of doing business. Member from Soufrer, Francis Jacques, how many, how, many, how many decades now? Can we point to any investor who's come to St. Lucia because of the ease of doing business report? It's about the cost of doing business, not the ease of doing business. So I'm very happy that the World Bank has foregone that and decided to move away in a different direction. But you know, for many years, exactly what the member was just saying, that every time there was an ease of doing business report, one of the things that's missing 
was our um, insolvency and bankruptcy, the two of them. The reality is that the economy has grown. And this has become a very costly exercise for the banks and for businesses attempting to recover monies that are owed to them and to individuals. And it's the banks who have been complaining the most for the longest period of time as to how this has increased their cost of operations. And some people have gone as far as to say the reason why the interest rate is where it is is because the banks have not found a mechanism to swiftly deal with non-performing loans, whether it be on a personal basis or whether it be on a, a corporate basis, Mr. Speaker. So let's not pretend that this is easy. And I want to say exactly what the member from Viewfort South said, is that the, the observations, the opinions, the input of the opposition is not to fight this. This is, this is necessary, but what we should not be, should not happen to us is that we feel compelled in any way to approve it in a, in, a, in a mechanism, a method that is being imposed by other people who are not sensitive to our particular issues. And let us not be scared to be different because sometimes in being different and being successful in those negotiations, that we actually may be a trendsetter. So let me give an example, Mr. Speaker. Grenada. Grenada was a trendsetter. That when the Grenada as a country went into bankruptcy, which they did, when they renegotiated the terms, they included a climate resilience clause. And what was that clause? The clause was that if in fact that there was a catastrophic event in Grenada, that all of the loans that the government have would be suspended until a certain period of time. And I certainly want to take now the words from the, again from the member of, of View Fort South, that that also had to be in detail as to what that is. What is a catastrophic event? How long are we allowed to put a moratorium on the repayments of the country? That didn't exist before, but now it's becoming standard language in every government loan that we negotiate. Every loan. We now have the climate thing, the, the loan you've just taken with the Saudis, climate. All the different loans, the World Bank, IMF, CDB, all the loans now include a climate clause. So my contribution today is in understanding the history of this, that this is attempting to create a legal mechanism to facilitate the banks and also facilitate companies and individuals who have been unfortunately caught up in bankruptcy. And consumers. And consumers, individuals, yeah. Because the fact is, is that you have too many people who cannot get rid of a debt and staying on the books of the bank because the bank is living in some hopes that they're going to get repaid. And then it's preventing that individual from getting a loan elsewhere. So it means that they have to go through their wife, they have to go through another family member, they have to go through another person and involve them in their business in order to be able to continue in business because they cannot do it in their own name. So this, uh, this is a, a proven mechanism that allows all parties to be able to move on. Now I say move on, but not necessarily move on satisfactorily, because whenever there's bankruptcy, there's always going to be somebody who feels that they didn't get their fair share. So whether it's the bank who said, man, I should have gotten this because I lent you this and I'm having to forego the interest payments, and it's the individual, individual who 
um, has, a, a has debt and, and, and feels that there should be some level of empathy towards them and feel that the court is too harsh and the business is too harsh and they, they, should, they should give a little man a brick. So not going to be ever a satisfactory outcome of what this is. But I take the words of the member from Viewfort South. I wish that I wish that we had listened to those words when it came to the CIP legislation, because it's the lack of the detail in the CIP legislation, Mr. Mr. Uh, Speaker, that's creating the chaos we have today. And when we talk about getting into the detail of a qualifications of a security person, tells you the level of detail that ought to be in an act and provisions of the act and the danger that it poses when we don't do that. And he's reminded us is that we may think of things being a particular way, but the courts are going to interpret it differently. So the detail matters. So what's the detail? The genesis of a fundamental change in this, which I think, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I certainly know when we discussed it in cabinet, primary residence was top of mind. So you know if a person has multiple houses, they have to identify one house as their primary residence, Mr. Speaker. So if you're going to speculate on buying real estate and you lose, then the bank should be able to move. But there becomes a limit where we say fundamentally, hey, if we are as a government, and I believe that we share that, that we want every St. Lucian to own a home. I have to believe that we all aspire for that. And that we're going to do everything that we can to get persons with money, give them access to land, and for them to own a home. And after going through all of that effort, I don't believe the same people here would turn around and make it that they can lose that home easily. I welcomed the addition of the... Uh, I think the, the was mentioned, it was a, um, uh, where is it? It is, um, no, terminal illness. You know, so I live in a family, we live in a home, we're depending on multiple incomes, somebody dies of terminal illness. But uh, Mr. Speaker, I don't think what we've written here is sufficient. I don't think that we should leave it to the interpretation of the judge as to what, or the supervisor, or the trustee, as to what should happen to somebody or family that has had a terminal illness and a loss of a primary um, uh, earner, contributor. What do we mean by that? So uh, we, yes, we identify that as a problem, but are we just going to leave it? I mean, I, when, you read, when you read sections 174, Mr. Speaker, from 174, Mr. Speaker, all the way to 176, 177, it's always talking about the, their interpretation. No, no detail to it as to what those exceptions are, Mr. Speaker. And again, it's not a criticism, it's a constructive point. Following up, and that's why I say that the timing of the member from Viewfort South's intervention was timely. Now, I noticed that like most of the acts, it also includes a provision for regulations, right? And I think that the, the uh, Attorney General made mention of the fact that the, the regulations are yet to come. I don't believe they've fully been drafted, but I don't know. But the point is, is that maybe those can come in the regulations and that there's some level of detail as to what the exception is. And the question is, if we're going to say that we're going to protect a person's primary home, should we not include other things because we live on a small island that is suspect to exogenous shocks? So, 
I have a small business. I've been paying for my home from the resources that I earn from the small business. My business burns down. We've all been through the process, or some of us have been through the process of when your house burns, you gotta get the insurance company to go in. Sorry, I'm speaking to the expert on that, Mr. Speaker. I'm speaking, speaking to the converted. You know what the process is. Process has to be a claim. The job of the insurance company, that doesn't make them bad, is to try to give you as little as possible. The objective of the person who was insured is to make sure the insurance company gives you more. But there's always a subject to the detail of the insurance policy that you have. But the fact is we know that this is not something that happens in one week. This takes time. Are we going, we had a great stress friend, over $6 million in one year. I'd like you to match that. I'm tired of hearing that nonsense about distress fund, Mr. Speaker. That's such rubbish, childish play. Here we're trying to have a significant discussion. I'm trying to contribute in a positive way. I'm saying to you, let us have more detail as to the exceptions that we're going to create for people to make sure that the idea of them securing and maintaining a primary residence, that we don't leave it to the interpretation and the whims of a judge or a trustee, because the way the language is written here, we're giving them all kinds of latitude as to what that amount is. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I really hope that you can get some of the people in your house to grow up, especially the member from Castries, Castries Center. I have never seen such childish behavior, right? Here we are talking about the lives of people you want to come and, and distract in typical way. We're talking about hardworking solutions who have, have a home and we're passing legislation in which we're going to allow other people to interpret it. We've already said that we want to protect your primary and we want to make exceptions for the primary home. We've said that we're going to accept terminal illness, but there are other things there. Hurricane, Hurricane fire. What are the other things that we can put in to make sure that the court recognizes that those are acceptable and compulsory things they must consider? And more importantly, how is it and who is going to make the determination how much of a moratorium they're going to get, if any? Because as I said, the people in St. Lucia have figured out through the Napoleonic Code how to protect themselves. The same business person that I was talking about had a business, I think the business has been in receivership for over 15 years. <laughs> and he's still holding control of it. Mine. You know the gentleman. Mine. Right? No and I'm not going to go there. Okay? It's the principle, not the person. The principle. The fact is, is that many people have learned how to play the banks. How to protect their own asset. And if we're going to introduce something, and we generally are here to represent all the persons in our constituencies, and let's take the advice of the member from View Fort South. Do not leave it to the interpretation of individuals who, who we don't know who they are. Don't leave it to the future interpretation of judges who may, this may come up afterwards and put their own interpretation. The way to avoid that is to be elucidly clear that we want person's primary home to be protected. And we don't want it to be that when there is a catastrophic event, an external shock. So when we talk about COVID, luckily, my administration negotiated with the banks for a moratorium on everybody. How is it that the person, how is it the person's, how is it the person's who would have been laid off the day after on April 1st when everything was shut down. What was gonna happen? What was gonna happen? Where would they have gone? And the panic it would have caused. So let us understand that if it happened with COVID, if it happened with Hurricane Tomas, where people's businesses, un, without their influence, it, it wasn't their fault, I see the member from Labry. I, I can't imagine how many times he has to go as the member, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Speaker, and ask for those exceptions for us as a state. And those, the reasoning for those exceptions 
also apply here because we are an overly um, export dependent, dependent economy. And many businesses and people's income might be affected. We're not even talking about a person who has been paying a mortgage for 20 years, Mr. Speaker. Because of, let's say, blacklisting with the Europeans, the business that they were involved in gets shut down overnight. And all of a sudden, they can't pay their mortgage. Should they be penalized? And I would say to you that even the idea, and I agree with the, the um, Attorney General, even if we say that we want, when the asset is sold, that they get some money, they're still losing the house. <laughs> and it's not their fault. And should they be given a period of time for recovery? So I'm not asking for every exception in the world. All I'm saying to you is, if somebody has been paying their mortgage because of something that's an exogenous shock, some kind of external, which is beyond their control, they don't have the ability to pack, pack it up and moving. In fact, what's going on right now is getting more and more difficult, Mr. Speaker, for anybody to move. I see what the UK has done. So the fact is, is that we ought to make sure that there's more details in this, Mr. Speaker, to provide the provisions of protection. And let me add another element to this, Mr. Speaker. By now passing the Insolvency Act, banks and other persons may be more anxious for people to go into insolvency and to declare bankruptcy in order to get the matters resolved even quicker. Because now there's, there's a mechanism for that to happen. And if that is the case, even more so people's businesses and homes and assets can become more vulnerable. And that's why I believe strongly that if we want every solution to have a home, we want solutions to feel proud and to be part of our economy, then what we should do is make sure that the exceptions are covered so they're not left alone. Can't be that they lose their home. Can't be that they lose their small business because of something that they had no control over. I get it that businesses change. Now, why is that even more important in the context of St. Lucia? I certainly was not part or privy to your cabinet discussions. I can say to you, the discussions that we were having is when the social net of our country is so weak. We don't have unemployment insurance in St. Lucia. So when somebody loses a job, all of a sudden, they're on their own, unless they've been saving money. So even more so, there has to be some language written into this to make up for the fact so far that we don't have those provisions and that some of these things don't take an immediate effect. Because I'm telling you, once the banks know that this has passed, the amount of time that they were giving people before, they're going to put even more pressure on because they're saying, hey, there's a solution to this problem. Because that's how they're going to think. And they have every right to think that way because they have other persons that they have to report to. But we must, I think, in creating a unique St. Lucia solution, is be cognizant of the fact that we don't have unemployment insurance. We don't have a robust social program where we're giving people monies enough to be able to pay their mortgage. We're barely giving people enough a month money to feed themselves. There's no criticism of me, but that's what the reality is. And when we keep on thinking that subsidizing rice, flour, and sugar somehow is solving the problem, they still have to have the money to buy it. Well, in case of San Lucia, we resolve that problem by making sure there is no rice, flour, and sugar. Right? But Mr. Speaker, I'm really hoping 
that this administration will take heed to what the member from Viewfort South has said, also to take in the best in the best value what the member from Choiseul has said as a former banker, and certainly as the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance under the former administration, explaining what we were doing and the pain that we were going through with regards to this particular, this particular bill. I mean, I think being able to get a solution based in Canada, but a solution nonetheless, um, through the consultancy with the World Bank and the IMF, was good. Because at least there was a level of nuance. I don't know if you know the individual member from... Okay. So I think that that was a good move, but I still think that there are aspects of this bill um, which should be more embedded. And as I said, I could not say it, Mr. Speaker, as well and as articulate as the member from Viewfort South. Detail. Detail, detail, detail. And I'm seeing so many pieces of legislation and so many things that are being rushed through which do not have that level of detail and are going to get this country and the reputation of our country in serious trouble. But in this particular case, it's going to be the individuals who are suffering. Because as I said, they're very acquainted to what the current system is. So the advice that was given by the member from Choiseul, which is that we need a substantially more robust education system about the introduction of this so that people are not going to find themselves marginalized, where persons can possibly get, I hope, more opinions and not just the opinions of their own lawyer. Um, but we are going to have a difficult time and there are a lot of hardships that can be caused by the lack of detail in this particular thing. It's well-meaning. Unfortunately for us, the day has to come. The opposition supports this. But the opposition puts the caveat that when we're going to be doing the regulations, that every effort should be made to provide advice to the courts and everyone else about what do we mean by protecting the primary um, home holder. Because that's very, very important. And we all have those persons in our constituency. We all know persons with small businesses in our constituency. And if this is left unchecked, it would impose a hardship on those persons and those small businesses, to the likes of which we will all be feeling, and we may find ourselves having to come back to the House and doing something retroactively. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.